Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another webinar tonight brought to you by New York Gastroenterology Associates. I am Dr. Janie Yang. I will be moderating the webinar tonight. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing two experts in the field of IBD and nutritional science who will give us their insights on IBD and give us an update on new treatments in the market. Our first expert is Faith, who is a registered dietitian and New York State Certified Dietitian Nutritionist at New York Gastroenterology Associates. Faith specializes in the convergence of gastro gastrointestinal health and eating disorders, employing a weight-inclusive non-diet approach to care, in her, um, to care in her practice. She has experience working with inpatient and outpatient behavioral, uh, behavioral health populations, previously working at the New York State Psychiatric Institute and as part of a group eating disorder practice. She also has a special interest in working with athletes and active populations. Faith earned her master's in nutrition and exercise physiology from Columbia <clears throat> University, where she also completed her dietetic internship. Our second expert is Dr. Asher Kornbluth, author Asher Kornbluth, received his medical degree from Downstate Medical University in New York and completed his postgraduate training in internal medicine as both um, resident and chief resident at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. He was a gastroenterology fellow at Mount Sinai Hospital Medical Center. As a medical educator, Dr. Kornbluth has taught and lectured extensively in United States and internationally. He is the founder and annual course co-director of the Mount Sinai IBD Consultants course for the last 18 years. He has received numerous awards as a medical educator, including the Teacher of the Year for six consecutive years at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. In 2009, he was awarded the William H. Doc Lifetime Master Teaching Award of Medicine um, from, from, the, from, the State University at, from the State University at Downstate Medical Alumni. He has been recognized over 30 times as chosen by his peers annually among Castle Connolly top doctors, New York best doctors, and super doctors featured in the New York Times. As a clinician, in his medical practice, he has mentored hundreds of medical students, residents, fellows, and visiting gastroenterologists from around the world. Dr. Kuron Booth has published more than 100 articles, abstracts, book chapters, and invited editorials, and is the principal author of the first three edition of the, ulcer of the Ulcerative Colitis Practice Guidelines in Adults, published by the American College of Gastroenterology. Um, currently, he is an investigator on a number of clinical trials examining new therapeutic agents in inflammatory bowel disease. So before I turn the microphone over, a few housekeeping matters. The webinar will be recorded and posted on our NYGA website where you can find the recordings of our previous webinars as well. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions, which I will help to address during the webinar. And we will try to answer and discuss as many questions as possible at the end as time allows. We aim to conclude this webinar at 7.30 p.m. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Faith and Dr. Kornbluth. So I'm happy to uh, start. Uh, it's a pleasure to do this. These actually started, I believe I did the first one about three years ago when unfortunately we were talking about COVID webinar after webinar. So uh, today we're gonna be speaking about new drug treatments for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are my disclosures uh, relevant to this talk uh, related to the drugs we'll be speaking about, Zaposia, which is from BMS, that's Ozanamod, Avvi, which is uh, Rinvolk, and Skyrizi. So when we talk about medications for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, it's not just about the risks of the disease versus the medications. We have to remember one of the complications of a medication is that it doesn't get you better. So we weigh the risk of the medication against the risk of the disease. And unfortunately, both of these diseases, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, can become inexorable progressive diseases. So it's important that when we consider medications, we're all concerned about potential side effects, toxicities, we think about the weight of the risk of uncontrolled inflammation leading to worsening disease. 
So first we'll start off with Crohn's disease. And again, it's important to remember that we're not looking now merely at how you feel. The most important thing we're aiming for is obviously to have you feel better, less pain, less diarrhea, less hospitalization, less complications from the disease. But we know, for instance, in Crohn's disease, if patients are not adequately treated, 80%, 80% will have progressive disease requiring active intervention, meaning medication. And in the old days, before we started with the biologic treatments, which I'll get to in a minute, two-thirds, at least two-thirds of people with Crohn's disease required surgery. And about half of those will have required a second operation. So about two-thirds will require at least one operation during their lifetime, and about one-third will require a second operation. Finally, in the last 20 years, as we collect this data, we're finding that we're making a big dent in the frequency of surgery, and in fact, probably more important, in the burden of suffering. So remember, we want to control inflammation because uncontrolled inflammation will result in irreversible bowel damage, ultimately leading to hospitalization and surgery. And we were used to just asking, how are you feeling? My beloved mentor, Dan President, which hopefully uh, many of you may have uh, met and was one of the great teachers and pioneers, he used to say, if you want to know how a patient's doing, and he's from Coney Island, he used to say, you want to know how a patient's doing, you say, how are you doing? And now we know that that's maybe the only thing that Dan was not right on, because we know that you can have patients who feel perfectly, no pain, no diarrhea, no constipation, no blockages, and yet they'll still have objective measures of inflammation, whether it's something you see on a colonoscopy, whether it's something you see on a CAT scan or an MRI, or even simply by blood test. One of them that many of you are familiar with was called SED rate, sedimentation rate. The other one is CRP, standing for C-reactive protein. And probably the one that's the most accurate and sensitive and responsive to our treatments is something called the FCP, which we call the CalPro, which is fecal calprotectin. Now, it's sort of a drag to have to collect stool, but now, as many of you know, we have these kits. You do it at home. comes with a nice pack, a pre-addressed, prepaid FedEx envelope, and you send it in. And that fecal calprotectin is probably our most um, accurate measure of active inflammation. And what's nice about it is reflective of active inflammation, and it's quantitative. You might start out with, say, we want to score of, let's say, under 100 or 150, and you start off with a score of 800. And you think you're getting better, and uh, two weeks later, you look, and it's still 800. Or you're getting a lot better, and it's down to 700. Maybe you're not getting as much better as you thought you are. So it's a quantitative number that we can follow. Now, so the three new drugs we're going to speak about today, and these have become available within the last two and a half years. For Crohn's disease, we have Skyrizi, and then we'll be speaking about for ulcerative colitis, we have Zaposia and Rinvo. Skyrizi is a drug that is an IV infusion monthly for three months, then you get an injection every eight weeks. How do patients do with this? Well, Obviously, what we're interested in is having our patients feel better as soon as possible. And here you can see that as early as week four, which means you got your first infusion, you're coming in for your second infusion, and this is all based on randomized placebo-controlled studies. This is not just data we're collecting in the office. These are the formal studies that were presented to the FDA that led to these drugs approval. You get one infusion IV, and then as early as week four, by the time you come in for the second dose and the endpoints are measured, you're seeing a clinical response. And that continues to increase out at week eight, which is when you're getting the third dose. And then you're looking out at week 12, and that's when you're going to get your first injection. And you see with time, that number continues to improve. And on the bottom, you're looking at the placebo. So you get a sense of how patients in the placebo arm, because these randomized trials I mean, we are matching patients ultimately in terms of their disease activity, the disease duration, the disease location, and people are randomized. So one group doesn't have more of a sicker patient than the other. And we don't know when we call it a double blind study. I don't know what the patient is getting and the patient doesn't know what they're getting. So it eliminates that sort of subjective impression that if you're on a drug, you think maybe you're getting better. So if you don't know what you're getting, and I don't know what you're getting, you're far more likely to get 
an objective measure. So any drug that goes in front of the FDA that ultimately gets approved has two phases. One is called the induction phase, which means the dose and the duration in which you are going to get better. And getting better could be either a clinical response, which in general refers to a score that indicates you got better by roughly, and there's a lot of wiggle room here, roughly by a third. With clinical remission, and we have very defined endpoints, but in a sense, clinical remission means no symptoms or you're feeling as well as you did before you got sick. And that's called the maintenance arm when you go out to week 52. So no drug is going to get approved based on just an eight-week or 12-week induction phase where you get better, but they're all demanded by the FDA. Show me your induction data, show me that you got better, and then show me that you're well all the way out to a year. And it's important to remember that, that we're dealing with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. By the time a drug has gone through all three phases, what's called phase one, phase two, phase three, the drug has been studied in maybe 1,500 patients in total for one year. So if you have a relatively rare but important complication that might happen in one in 3,000 patients, one in 5,000 patients, which the dreaded one is, let's say, lymphoma, for drugs in the Remicade Umira family, that might only happen in one in 3,000, one in 5,000. It might take two or three years to develop. So when we have a one-year study, you might be limited in what the complications may be. So that's important to keep in mind. And that's why all of these drugs, all these companies keep real-world registries for safety. Remember, we're dealing with Crohn's and colitis. This is not diabetes or hypertension or the COVID vaccines where you study 20 or 30 or 40,000 patients before it comes to market. So that's important to keep in mind. So in this study, this is Skyrizi. This is how the patients look in terms of a clinical remission out at week 52, slightly more than half the patients. Now, we always will look at in these drug studies, all of them in patients who are what we call bio-naive versus bio-experienced. What does that mean? Bio-naive means you have not been previously on a biologic drug defined as, say, Remicade, Umira, Stolera, and Tivio. Those are the biologics. You haven't gotten those. Versus a group of patients who comes into the study who have already been on those drugs, Remicade, Umira, Stolera, and Tivio. Those patients are called bio-experienced or bio-exposed. And obviously, patients who have been through those drugs will tend to be a sicker, more refractory group of patients. And that's why all of these studies, you're going to see data for both the bio-naive patient who comes in getting this drug without those prior biologics versus patients who have already been on those biologics. And those patients will get better, as you see here, but not as frequently as patients who have never had a biologic, stands to reason. Now, whenever we look at a new drug, obviously everybody wants to know what the side effects are. Let me make a point here that took me quite a while to realize. Patients would come in and they'd say, gee, I heard about this new drug you have, and it's a biologic. And they would have this grave look of fear because it's a biologic. And I finally realized why that word strikes fear and terror into so many people. Because for many years, our only biologic class of drugs were the anti-TNF drugs, basically Remicade and Umira. We had those since 1998. Remicade's around for a quarter of a century. So we have a huge experience with that class of drugs. But everyone's concern with Remicade and then Umira and that class of drugs was that it, quote, causes cancer. Now, it doesn't cause cancer. But there is an increased risk of lymphoma with those drugs. And the number varies depending on what study you look at. And it's about one in 3,000 or maybe one in 5,000 per patient year. So that was the bad stigma biologics have. Then came along other drugs that we're not speaking about tonight, very valuable drugs that are biologics, things like Stolera or Antivio, which are remarkably safe, don't have infection risks, don't have lymphoma risks, but still have the word biologics appended to them and people were nervous about it. It finally dawned on me it's the word biologic because people associated them with Remicade and Umira and that class of drugs, which are remarkably effective. I'm not putting those drugs down. But all the word biologic means, and I explain this to all my patients, so I'm starting on one of these drugs, is that the drug was prepared in part in a living cell. Old-fashioned insulin from a pig 
Porcine insulin, in a sense, that's a biologic. Humulin, that's been around for 30 years. Humanized insulin, that's a biologic. So just because the word biologic is there doesn't mean it's a dangerous drug. And if you look here, Fortify, all these studies get fancy names these days. If you look at the placebo group on the left versus all the way on the right, you see Skyrizi group. If you look at in the red box, you're looking at serious AEs or severe AEs, those mean adverse events. They're actually less with Skyrizi. If you look at infections, they're less with Skyrizi. Now, how could that be? I'm a fan of these drugs, but they're not antibiotics. How could you have fewer side effects in terms of infections with a biologic? Why? Because once the patient gets better, they're getting off steroids, which is the worst evil. They're getting off other drugs like immunosuppressants, 6-MP and azathioprine, that increase the risk of infections. So getting well with a drug may actually reduce your likelihood of many of these complications. Skyrizi in terms of convenience, Three IV fusions, week zero, a month later, and then a month after that. And then actually four weeks after that, you get the first injection, and then it's every eight weeks. So after the first three IV infusions, you're basically just getting six doses a year. Now, that is basically what we have new in Crohn's disease. And there are new drugs coming in the pipeline, one of which will probably be approved very soon, which is on this slide, RINVO, so far approved for ulcerative colitis a little bit over a year ago. And we'll talk about it in ulcerative colitis. And you'll note that's a very effective drug, one of our most effective drugs perhaps ever. And it's also turning out to be very effective in Crohn's disease as well. My understanding is, is that the FDA is going to issue its ruling in June. And I don't have any inside information, but I'd be shocked if it wasn't approved because of its results that are public information from their large phase three studies. Symposia is already approved for ulcerative colitis over two years ago. It's been approved for MS, multiple sclerosis, for about two to three years. And other drugs in that class, known as S1P drugs, which I'll get to in a moment, have been around for about a decade for multiple sclerosis. So that too is not a new class of drug. And we know people with ulcerative colitis have been on these drugs, 5-ASA drugs, those are the misalamine, Lialda, Colazole, Azacol. That family of drugs have been around since the 1950s. Three quarters of patients will get those. Unfortunately, up to two thirds of people, 66% will be on steroids. Let me make a very clear point here. There should be no, no such thing as a steroid dependent patient, period. Mic drop whatever the expression is, because if you are on prednisone and dependent on it and can't get off of it, you have to go on something else. In thousands of patients I have in my practice, I may have one patient who is on five milligrams of prednisone or less because they can't get less than say three or four milligrams. I am talking about one patient, maybe in thousand. If you are on prednisone more than blank number of weeks to months, fill in the blank, eight weeks, 12 weeks, maybe three or four months, you have to get off prednisone. We are doing you a disservice if you remain on prednisone month after month. It is a remarkably quick fix, and that's why we became so enamored with it over the last 60 years, but it becomes far more likely to be a problem than your savior if you're on it for more than a few months. Biologics, again, they've been around since 1998 for us, Remicade, then Umira subsequently Antivio and Stolera, very effective drugs. They have really changed the world for our patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, but no drug works in 100% of patients. And our best drugs, if we get them to work in two thirds of patients, we're doing very well. So what do we have in ulcerative colitis now beyond what we've had for the last 60 years? And so I'm gonna show you because everyone with ulcerative colitis for sure has had at least one sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy. And just to know what we see when we're looking on that huge flat screen, high def TV, while hopefully you're deep asleep on propofol, let me finally show you what it looks like if your doctor hasn't handed you the report. And I could tell you this is about 7 p.m. 
you're eating dinner. This is not at all gross. I'm going to show you pictures of people who have been very well prepped. And I tell people, when you're looking at these photographs, I can tell you that you might look at the back of a fundus, the back of your retina, and it'll look exactly like this. Zero here. This is a beautiful, shiny lining of the colon. And we call the lining the mucosa. These red lines, I'm not sure you can see my cursor. These are beautiful, healthy blood vessels. These white spots, that's just light reflection from our very bright scope. But this is smooth and shiny. That's a zero. That's normal. Here, the lower number is better. One, you don't have all those nice, beautiful blood vessels. It looks a little bit like someone took some sandpaper, perhaps, and rubbed it against the lining, against the mucosa. In number two, which is moderate, zero is normal, one is considered mild, and these are all scored in a double-blind fashion when we do studies. You start seeing some areas where there's some fresh blood. Here, it's pretty minimal. You see some areas where there's perhaps a couple of tiny little baby ulcers. We call those erosions. And in severe disease, these white areas are broader, deeper ulcers. You see fresh blood just sitting there in the colon as we put the scope in. And as we could see here, thank God, this is a well-prepped patient. And this is something that is easy to look at. And there are very fine definitions for studies about what's mild, moderate, or severe, because sometimes there's some overlap. But in a way, it's like Chief Justice, I don't know if he's a Chief Justice, one of the Supreme Court justices said, I think it was John Paul Stevens, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know what the definition of, of pornography is, but I know it when I see it. So I know when something looks like severe colitis in picture three, it doesn't look anything like number one. So we could tell pretty easily. Now, the drugs we have that are new for ulcerative colitis, there are two that we'll speak about. Supposedly has been around for about two and a half years, called Ozanamod. It's an oral drug. Skyrizi we talked about is three IV infusions and then injections. Zaposia is a once a day oral drug. It's a pill. And it's for the same kind of patients. All of these three drugs were approved for moderate to severe disease, not the mild kinds of inflammation moderate to severe. Now, Zaposia is in that same indication, moderate to severe, but strictly speaking, it's not a biologic drug. It is a chemical drug, or the fancy word is a small molecule, which is a fancy way to say it's a pill, once a day. And it's in a family of S1P modulators. Now, that's a funny word, modulator. We don't have any other drugs that we call modulators. Generally, they're receptor antagonists or agonists. What is S1P? Since it's New, I'll give you a quick explanation. S1P stands for sphingosine 1-phosphate. It's throughout the body, including in the nervous system. That's why blocking it helps in multiple sclerosis. It gets into the lymphocyte, an activated lymphocyte. This is one of our white blood cells that causes most of the inflammation. When that S1P gets into that white blood cell in the presence of ozanamod, which is zaposia, or other S1P drugs, once that lymphocyte, which is activated and destined to cause all the problems, once Ozanamod, suppose it comes along, that lymphocyte, that activated white blood cell, gets trapped in this local lymph node. You're familiar with lymph nodes, let's say in your neck, when you get a cold, you get swollen lymph nodes. We have lots and lots of them around our intestine. And the T lymphocytes, that's the name of this particular kind of white blood cell, sees Zaposia, it gets trapped in that lymph node. It can't get out to head toward the in intestines where it's destined to cause inflammation. Here we see a symptomatic response, which is again an improvement by at least a third and a remission means it gets you back to normal as early as week two. If you look at the curves on the left, this is a symptomatic response. In other words, the bleeding and the frequency of stool decreases as early as week two. And in the blue curve, it continues to improve all the way out to week 10. But again, I don't like to tell a patient, I'm starting on a new drug, I'll see you in 10 weeks and you'll be better in 10 weeks. I'd like to know that I'm getting benefits sooner. And this study, when we're looking at the word symptomatic, we're not looking yet at the endoscopic picture. This is based purely on what you tell us in terms of the amount of diarrhea there is and the amount of bleeding. And in terms of remission, 
means these symptoms go entirely back to normal. You see, it doesn't quite get that much better that quickly. It's a much higher bar to clear. And the return on your investment, so to speak, with the active drug starts to be seen on week four. The blue is in patients who got the drug. Week four, the gray is in placebo. And you can see the placebo curve stays sort of flat, whereas patients with remission continue to get better. Now, I like to know I could get my patient better within a couple of weeks, but I am not doing my patient a favor if they get better by 10 weeks. And at the end of 52 weeks, they're not still well. So we're always looking again for that maintenance of remission. And in all drugs, it's roughly 52 weeks. Some studies 52 weeks, some 48 weeks, but basically a year. And here you see on the top, CS free remission, corticosteroid, meaning prednisone, free remission. If I have a patient in total remission and they're even on 10 milligrams of prednisone, I have failed that patient. No remission really exists if the patient is still on prednisone. If you're on prednisone for more than a few months, you got to be on something else or you got to find another doctor. You should not live on prednisone. Now, this is an open label extension on the right, meaning patients who came out of the study and then will continue to be followed. If you were in remission at the end of one year, basically three quarters of the people remained well. So if you get there at the end of year one and you're remission, three quarters of the people will still be in remission at the end of the second year. It's relatively speaking, a very safe drug. What you will see on the left hand, uh, excuse me, in the middle slide, in the middle of the slide is the posia and the upper respiratory tract infections about the same. Liver test abnormalities can happen in about 5% of patients. They are almost always entirely reversible. And when you look at for a 52 weeks, up to 11% of people will have elevation in the liver blood test. Again, always reversible. Now, again, we have to say, is the drug net-net when you're looking at side effects, is it of benefit? Well, in fact, if you look at AEs, which means adverse events, T-E-A-Es, means treatment emergent adverse events. That's our fancy expression for drug studies. You got put on a treatment and you had an adverse event. Well, look what happens out at week 52 in the maintenance. Look on the bottom line on the right. Zyposia, 1.3% of patients dropped out because of an adverse event. And that's half as much as patients who had an adverse event on placebo. Now, this is not a dangerous placebo pill, but it is dangerous in the sense that you're not getting better. You're withdrawing from the study because your colitis is getting worse. So remember, a side effect of a drug is if it doesn't get you better. So that's what we need to keep in mind, the risk of the drug against the risk of the disease. The newest drug we have is about a year old again for ulcerative colitis. I'm almost certain it'll be approved very shortly for Crohn's disease, whereby it'll be probably equally effective as you see here. It's called the JAK kinase inhibitor. It's the second drug in that family. The other one we have is called Zeljans, approved for ulcerative colitis, not for Crohn's disease. And us hipsters like to call these drug jacks. We have a new drug. It's a new jack. That's Rinvo. Not a new drug, though. It's been approved already for RA, rheumatoid arthritis, PSA, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. This is x-ray negative ankylosing spondylitis. Actually, the first drug that we cross over with atopic dermatitis, a, fam a fancy word to say eczema and ulcerative colitis. And in fact, most of our drugs that work in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's work in these diseases, so particularly rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and psoriatic arthritis, because there's a lot of common mechanisms. And often the drug companies will study these drugs first in rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis, because if you think about it, those are much easier drug studies to do. They're much cheaper studies to do. If I want to know if your psoriasis is better, you get undressed and I count how much of the body surface area has psoriasis. If I want to know if your rheumatoid arthritis is better, I ask you questions about how many joints are stiff in the morning. I look at your x-rays and that's basically it. You don't need as many blood tests. You don't need colonoscopies. You don't need CAT scans. They're much easier studies to do. And they have proof of concept in those diseases. And then those drugs come to us. So this drug probably works quicker than any drug we've had, save maybe prednisone and maybe Remicade. 
these drugs, the JAK kinase inhibitors, Zeljans as well, but especially Rinvolt. Here you see that you start seeing real separation. The gray curve on the bottom is patients who got placebo versus the yellow patients who got Rinvo. This is, again, a once-a-day pill. It's not a biologic. Some docs even confuse it with biologics because it's used in the same patients that you see who get the biologics for moderate to severe disease. It's used in the moderate to severe patient. And Rinvo has maybe the highest response and remission rates of any drug we have, even though it's just a pill. This refers to patients with rectal bleeding. SFS in the top here is stool frequency score, the exact same story, urgency, the exact same story, very high response rates and early. This is remission at week eight. Only 4% of patients on placebo had a remission. That tells you it's a sick group of patients because only 4% of placebo patients, eight times as many, 33% had a remission, not a response, not improvement, but remission at week eight. Now, 33% might not seem like it's hitting it out of the park, but I can tell you all of the other drugs we have in terms of remission are usually in the high teens or low 20s. And you say, gee, why would I use a drug that has only 20% chance of success? Because in the real world, we always do much better than in the studies, because the studies are really highly restricted in what we can and can't do. If you look on the right, you see bio-naive patients, patients who never got the biologic drugs, do much better than the placebo, but even bio-failure patients, patients who have already been through Remicade, Umira, Stolera, and Tivio, even those people do far better than placebo. And this really makes the point, again, clinical response as early as week two, 60% have a clinical response as early as week two. And we even have data that as early as day one, as early as day one, patients on Rinvo do better than patients on placebo. Again, I don't want a drug that I get my patients better at week eight and by week 52, they're all back on some other medication. This is the 52 week outcomes in terms of, again, steroid-free clinical remission. And we have different doses of Rinvoke. You get started on 45 milligrams. After the induction period, you get switched to either 15 milligrams or 30 milligrams. Your doc has a choice which one they choose. And in fact, 30 milligrams works somewhat better than the 15 milligrams. Special uh, adverse events of special interest. Well, they're all of special interest, but these are the kind of side effects we're used to thinking about in drugs that have effects in terms of suppressing the immune system in one way or the other. If you look at adverse events leading to discontinuation of study drug, it's a lot less with Rinvoke than with placebo. Again, because an adverse event means you got sick and you had to come out of the study because you were sick. In terms of 52 weeks, placebo, 10% of patients had to stop this drug and 2% or 4.8% with Rinvo. This is an immunosuppressive drug. Is it going to have a lot more infections? Well, look all the way out to week 52. Placebo, 6% infections, 15 or 30 milligrams of Rinvo, half of that. Active TB, you don't see any of that. We worry about that a little bit with the um, anti-TNF drugs. Zoster, which is shingles, we didn't show, I didn't highlight the data, but it's there for uh, Zaposi as well. About five or 6% of patients and none in placebo. So that's a real issue. And fortunately, now we have a non-live vaccine. We don't like giving live vaccines if we're giving patients drug that suppress the immune system. And everyone should get Shingrix, the shingles vaccine, if they're going to get either Zaposia with about a three or 4% chance of shingles or getting Rinvo or Zelgen, the Jack family. And I tell my patients, I don't, here, you will might hold your breath a little bit. I don't care what you felt about the COVID vaccine. But if you ain't going to take Shingrix, I ain't giving you this med. There's no reason you should get shingles. Shingles is like, <laughs> shingles, they used to say this, I think about herpes. Shingles like love is forever. You cannot get rid of it. You might get an infection. I could give you an antibiotic, it'd go away, but it lives in your nerve roots and it could keep coming back. And as you get older, it comes back more frequently. It's harder to treat. 
and is more painful. And it lives in your nerves, so it's a particular kind of pain that you won't forget. So to summarize, new drugs in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We're almost suffering from an abundance of riches here. We These three new drugs, we've taken about 30 years before this to get three new drugs. And before that, it took us 50 years to get three new drugs. Remember, and I like to say this to my patient, we have so many new drugs now. No drug works in everyone, but we should be striving. There should be no such thing as your new normal. Your new normal, I tell my patients, should be like your old normal, meaning before you had Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Try not to settle for less. Now, that doesn't mean in 100% of patients will we get there all the time. Jim George, my partner, once said, and it's not his original expression, the enemy, sometimes the enemy of good is better. So sometimes if we're doing well with our medications, pushing and pushing, we might be coming up against the wall and really subjecting people to side effects they don't need if things are well. But my goal always is not a new normal. It's the old normal like you never had Crohn's or colitis. Having said that, before we switch from one to another, maybe we're tempted to keep jumping because we have all these new drugs. Make sure the drug you're on has been optimized. And there are way we do this in terms of increasing the dose, watching for drug levels. It's become an art in itself. Remember, a drug works better when you got it and not on your shelf or in our cabinet waiting for it to be infused and someone doesn't show up for their infusion or their injection. And that goes to the point convenience matters. Some people say, I can't stand injections. I'd rather have IV. Some people say, I don't want an injection or an IV. I'd rather take a pill once a day, like Zaposia, like Rinvo. Other people would say, rather than take a pill 365 days a year and remind myself I have this disease, I'd rather take an injection six times a year and forget about it. So remember, think about what's most convenient that will actually lead for you to actually get the drug as prescribed. And remember, this is a disease of the gut. And our gut eats what we eat. And an inflamed gut is a more sensitive gut. So that is a transition and a segue to someone who I've learned a tremendous amount from, Faith Aronowitz, and one of our three dietitians in, dietitians in New York Gastro, along with Susie Finkel and Tamara Freuman. We have the great benefit of working full-time for us in patients with digestive diseases, not just Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but as you'll see, Faith has tremendous experience and knowledge in treating these diseases with diet. And again, I'll make the point here, and I don't think Faith will argue, diet is incredibly important to what we put into an inflamed gut, but it shouldn't replace the medications we have at the same time. And that leads to my transition over to you, Faith. All right. Thank you very much for that, that segue. And yes, I do happen to agree. Um, we will be talking a lot about diet as an adjunctive therapy um, here. So, um, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, diet and its relationship to IBD. Um, so there's actually been quite a bit of research that has been published in the last few years that suggests that diet does actually matter in terms of potentially increasing the risk of developing IBD as well as acting as an adjunctive therapy to maximize the effectiveness of medication. So like Dr. Kornbluth just mentioned, um, there's no research to suggest that diet should replace medical treatment here. And to highlight uh, how timely some of this research is, uh, what you see up on the slide here is the updated European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism Clinical Nutrition Guidelines for IBD, it's ESPIN for short. Um, which in 2017, and this up this year. Uh, so today we'll cover the most recent research uh, regarding the relationship between diet and disease pathogenesis or development, uh, use of diet as a therapeutic tool, and then overall nutrition recommendations for patients with IBD. So there are numerous studies that support a link between diet and the development of IBD. Studies show that diets in adolescents are actually linked to the risk of developing IBD later in life, uh, in that an increased intake of fruits, veggies, and fish actually seem to have a protective effect. Um, and uh, much of the current research has to do with the gut microbiota 
and looking at how our dietary patterns affect the gut microbiota and their interaction with our immune system, and in turn, how this interaction may influence inflammation in the body. So as far as specific foods and risk of development of IBD, a 2021 study which tracked the dietary habits and health outcomes of 116,000 people over nine years showed that the more servings of ultra-processed food consumed daily, the greater the risk of developing IBD. And specifically, people who consumed five or more servings of ultra-processed food daily had an 82% greater risk of developing IBD compared with people who consumed less than one serving of ultra-processed foods per day. So what exactly are ultra-processed foods? Sort of a buzz term and can be a little bit confusing. Minimally processed, processed, ultra-processed um, kind of hard to sort of suss out what, what exactly is an ultra processed food. And so the definition, as you see here on the slide, uh, formulations of ingredients, mostly of exclusive industrial use, typically created by series of industrial techniques and processes. So what does that actually mean? <laughs> um, so this definition of comes from the NOVA classification system, was developed by Brazilian nutrition researcher Carlos Montero and his team. Uh, and it groups foods into four different categories according to the level of processing. So ultra processed foods are foods that contain few, if any, ingredients that come directly from natural plant or animal foods. So you can see here um, on the slide some examples, you know, foods like soda, sweetened breakfast cereals, packaged cookies, packaged white breads, you know, hamburger and hot dog buns artificially flavored cheese crackers, mashed potato flakes, energy drinks, uh, flavored granola bars um, with added sugar and preservatives are some of the examples here. All right, so let's switch gears a bit and talk about the role of diet in the treatment of IBD. And we will start with fiber, friend or foe, we'll find out. So historically, a low fiber diet was recommended to patients with IBD. You know, maybe there'd be some applesauce or a small amount of cooked carrots in the diet, but that was really about it. But recent studies have demonstrated the importance of dietary fiber intake in patients with IBD for a number of different reasons, including reduction of flares, increased time between flares, reduced instances of pouchitis in people with ulcerative colitis, and increased production of short chain fatty acids by gut microbes. So when we eat fiber, we nourish our gut microbes with this fiber, right? Our gut microbes then produce anti-inflammatory compounds called short-chain fatty acids, which provide a number of benefits to the body and overall can help to promote a less inflammatory environment in the gut. And fiber, as we know, is certainly not one size fits all. Um, and for a deep dive into fiber, I highly recommend my fellow dietitian colleague, Susie Finkel's webinar on fiber, which you can find on our website. Um, as we don't have time for that full discussion today. Um, but generally, soluble fiber is more digestively tolerable than insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber is the type of fiber that's typically found in the flesh of fruits and veggies. You know, for example, melon, papaya, avocado, squash, asparagus tips, it tends to be a gentler form of fiber overall uh, in comparison to insoluble fiber. And in our practice, we also talk a lot about particle size of fiber, right? So in a flare or when there is stricturing or history of, or history of obstructions, texture modification of fiber can be very beneficial. So for example, a giant kale salad with nuts and seeds and beans, you know, the, the largest, most voluminous salad you could think of could be harmful for someone with strictures and with and for someone without may agitate any kind of inflamed tissue um, in the gut. But if you blend it up into a smoothie or, or a soup, you have a very different situation. So what we say in our practice is that uh, if it fits into a straw, it'll fit in your intestines. And that's, I believe that's our, our senior dietitian Tamara Duke of Freeman's line, if I, if I am correct. Uh, so really it's the physical particle size of the fiber that's the key here. Um, which is important because it opens up a variety of options for our patients in which they're not unnecessarily restricting these very nutrient-dense anti-inflammatory foods. So continuing the conversation about the role of diet in IBD, we come to enteral nutrition. 
which is basically a fancy name for liquid nutrition. And so there isn't great evidence that therapeutic diets alone can take the place of medication, as I've mentioned. Uh, however, the most promising evidence of diet as a primary treatment is exclusive enteral nutrition, or EEN for short. So this is the avoidance of all solid foods for six to 12 weeks, replaced by nutritionally complete liquid meal replacements, such as Ensure or Boost. And most research regarding EEN is focused on the pediatric population. However, in the adult population, there is some research that suggests that a period of EEN prior to surgery may reduce post-op complications or even the need to have surgery at all. Um, partial enteral nutrition, PEN, is another type of enteral nutrition in which some solid nutrition is replaced with liquid meal replacements. And a meta-analysis of four studies of patients with Crohn's who were taking Remicade demonstrated that those patients who combined the medication with a diet protocol that included PEN were twice as likely to achieve disease remission compared with those only taking the medication without PEN. And so this research offers some promising evidence for the supportive role of diet in IBD treatment overall. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about recommended dietary patterns in CD and UC. So this chart here on the slide is from the International Organization for the Study of Inflammatory Bowel Disease 2020 Guidelines, it's at the IOIBD for short, a lot of acronyms here. Um, the IOIBD formed a working group to formulate diet recommendations for physicians, dietitians, and patients based on the best available evidence we have about the link between dietary patterns and IBD risk and outcomes. So the 2020 guidelines suggest that it is prudent to increase intake of fruits and vegetables for those with Crohn's disease specifically, and to increase the intake of omega-3 fatty acids for those with ulcerative colitis specifically. Um, excellent sources of omega-3 fatty acids include fish, seafood, uh, walnuts, flax seeds, and flaxseed oil, chia seeds, uh, and hemp seeds. The guidelines also recommend a decreased intake of saturated fat for both diseases, uh, which is found in red meat, whole milk dairy, as well as coconut oil and palm oil. And following what we discussed earlier regarding ultra-processed foods, the guidelines recommend a decrease in consumption of ultra-processed foods that contain specific additives. Some of these additives here, as you can see on the slide, include carboxymethylcellulose and carrageenan, typically found in plant-based milks and dairy products, artificial sweeteners such as aspartame or equal, as you might know it better, and sucralose or Splenda. So with all of that said, it's important to consider the overall dietary pattern versus individual foods or ingredients. For example, if someone with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis eats a very well-balanced diet with lots of whole or minimally processed foods, it's very doubtful they'd have to worry about a little bit of a specific additive here or there in, in the overall context of their diet. So two of the more commonly used diets that highlight high intake of fruits and veggies and limit additives from ultra processed foods as recommended by the IOIBD are the specific carbohydrate diet or SCD and the Mediterranean diet or MED diet for short. SCD we'll talk about first was originally developed by pediatrician Dr. Sidney Haas as a treatment for celiac disease in the 1920s. It was then popularized in the 1990s by biochemist Elaine Gottschall in her book called Breaking the Vicious Cycle. So the diet itself is a grain-free, lactose-free, low-sugar diet in which essentially all foods must be minimally processed. Mm -hmm. All grains and starchy veggies, such as sweet potatoes, are eliminated, as are certain legumes, such as chickpeas and soybeans. Nuts are allowed uh, on this diet, whereas seeds are not. The only sugar allowed must be sourced from small amounts of honey, fruit, and fruit juice. And based on this set of restrictions, the foundation of the diet is animal proteins, nuts, fruit, non-starchy veggies, some beans and legumes, and lactose-free dairy. So as you can sort of see, the diet can be quite restrictive as it limits the intake of practically all packaged foods and makes it very difficult to eat out at restaurants. 
Uh, in order to follow this type of diet, you must have the means and the time to be able to cook food from scratch and bring meals and snacks with you during the day. The less restrictive option is the med diet, which is a high fiber diet that encourages plant-based foods, including high intakes of heart healthy unsaturated fats, such as avocado, nuts, seeds, olive oil, fatty fish, such as salmon, as well as minimal consumption of red meat and dairy products. So the med diet differs from SCD in that it encourages whole grains, beans and legumes and seeds. So the first randomized control trial comparing SCD and the med diet as adjunctive treatments for people with Crohn's disease was published in 2021. And so if you look here um, on the, the bar graph part of the slide, um, right under Crohn's disease, oops, Crohn's disease symptomatic remission. Um, you can see that at six weeks, both the SCD and the med diet groups achieved symptom remission at comparable rates with the SCD diet at 46.5% and the med diet at 43.5%. So according to these and some additional outcomes in the study, the researchers concluded that neither the SCD nor the med diet provide superior therapeutic benefit and that it may be prudent to consider the med diet overall, citing its less restrictive nature, uh, as well as all of the other well-studied health benefits associated with the med diet. And these, these include things such as reduced risk of developing cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, uh, and Alzheimer's disease, to name just a few. And I also want to highlight the fact that many of the foods that are actually forbidden in SCD are encouraged in the med diet. So one hypothesis of the therapeutic benefit of SCD would be that the benefit is actually associated more with the increased intake of fruits and veggies and elimination of ultra processed foods rather than the elimination of grains, starches, seeds and certain legumes. Uh, although we certainly need more research in this area. All right, so nutrition takeaways. Takeaway number one, nutrition is important and it does matter. Uh, your dietary pattern can work in conjunction with your medical treatment to help you manage symptoms and to decrease inflammation overall. Takeaway number two, fiber is your friend. Uh, it's really just about manipulating the physical properties of fibrous foods to make them work for you. Uh, number three, focusing on a whole foods anti-inflammatory diet pattern that minimizes ultra processed foods is the way to go. Um, and finally, as I think was fairly evident over the course of, you know, the last few minutes here is that there's no universal IBD diet recommendation. So we highly recommend scheduling a consult with our nutrition team for individualized recommendations uh, that will be appropriate for you. And with that, I will go ahead and hand things back over to Dr. Yang for some Q&A. All right. So that was a great talk. So we have about five minutes to get some questions answered for you. Um, let me ask Faith one question. Any thoughts about supplements for inflammatory bowel disease? That's a, a great question, which I didn't uh, include for the sake of time here. Um, but there are, typically with supplementation, we're looking to replete any, you know, any micronutrients that might be uh, deficient and or also looking to manage any side effects of some medications. Like for example, if somebody's on steroids, we're concerned about bone density and, and looking to make sure that they're getting appropriate levels of calcium and vitamin D. Um, there are uh, a couple of supplements that have been studied. Curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric, um, has been shown to be effective. So that's something we certainly recommend in our practice. Um, but there definitely needs to be a lot more research uh, in this area. Excellent. That was, a, yeah, that was my main thought about curcumin or turmeric, like what the effect of it. As far as I know, it's uh, the, I think turmeric or curcumin is the only one that's proven to show to be effective in all sort of colitis specifically. Um, and there's, it, it has to hit a certain um, grams of intake for it to be effective for the studies that, that are evidence-based, essentially. 
That's right. There's quite a quite a broad uh, range there of what's been shown to be effective. Right. Um, all right. So some IBD question for Dr. Kornbluth. Um, when it comes to the mechanism of Scarizzi and Stellara, they're very similar medications. Um, one patient asked, wanted to know if someone has been on Stellara already and failed Stellara, does that mean they cannot be on Scarizzi anymore? That are un left unseen, but there it is. There you go. You're Welcome. on. <laughs> okay, so Stellara inhibits something called interleukin-12 and 23. Skyrizi inhibits interleukin-23. So you think, well, gee, you're blocking IL-12, IL is interleukin-12, and 23 is probably a better drug. Turns out maybe IL-12, interleukin-12, is a good thing, and by blocking it with Stellara, you're sort of mitigating, lessening the benefit of blocking IL-23. So we always say you can't compare across studies, different patients in different studies. But in general, the results with Skyrizi look very good. And maybe, again, we can't compare across studies, but maybe even stronger than with Stellara. Having said that, maybe Skyrizi looks better because you get three IV infusions a month apart at time zero, one month, and two months, whereas Stellara was only one IV infusion. Maybe if Stellara had been given three times IV, it would do just as well. But yes, you can, in fact, to answer the question, not get better with Stolero or get better and lose response and still get better with Skyrizi. Those patients were included in the Skyrizi studies and those patients did just as well, in fact, as patients who had never had Stolero. Excellent, good. It's good to know that Skyrizi is still an option. Um, what is the reason the long-term cortisone or corticosteroid is contraindicated? Okay, so in the short term, and it's not a Band-Aid, I, I distinguish a Band-Aid like something like a modium or a modal that handles symptoms, which is worthwhile. There's no reason someone even with active inflammation should have to always think about where the bathroom is and urgency and 10 balance a day if you can control with the modium or a modal. And I always say the end of that sentence is, if you're constipated or bloated, you took too much, and that's potentially dangerous. Steroids is a quick fix. It's not a Band-Aid. It's a very potent anti-inflammatory drug. Having said that, there is just about no organ in your body that will not be damaged with prednisone or any steroid. In the very short term, in the first few days or weeks, it's mood, irritability, insomnia. You get that big round, puffy face, the derogatory, it's not a derogatory term. Traditionally, it's been called a moon face. I don't like that term. I find it sort of uh, downputting. I call it the official term is cushingoid face acne. This can all happen within the first couple of weeks. People get hungry beyond belief and they gain weight. It's not healthy weight. The weight you put on with steroids is fat and water. And don't confuse these kinds of steroids with the steroids that athletes use. Those are called catabolic steroids. They build muscle. The steroids we use are anabolic. They destroy muscle. So it's important to remember that whatever exercise you could get while you're on prednisone is all for the good because you're going to be wasting muscle. Glaucoma, cataracts, hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, something known as a vascular necrosis where you could break bones without even thinning your bones. These are all complications among others from steroids. Have to get off steroids. So when it comes to steroids, is budesonide as dangerous as prednisone? Okay, that's a great question. So budesonide has been around a long time. Uh, some of you might have heard of budesonide inhalers for asthma. I describe it as a weak cousin of prednisone. Budesonide has its benefit, and it's approved for ulcerative colitis, both in a pill form and in a foam form that you use rectally for ulcerative colitis. It has what's called first-pass hepatic metabolism. On your first pass, in plain English, first pass through your body, the hepatic, the liver metabolizes it, breaks it down. So you don't get residual large amounts of circulating steroids. Having said that, there might be some steroid effect, and that's why we don't like to use these drugs for more than a few months in general. All right. I think we hit all the important questions, and it's exactly 7.30. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. If you want to replay this, it will be posted on our website. Um, so please join us again in probably a month for another webinar. Have a good night, everyone.